Cheryl, welcome to the show. Hey, Brittany, thanks for having me. Oh, I am so excited to have you here. We've had 163 episodes and none have been about bones. And I just want to raise my hand and say, my bad, y'all, my bad, Femtech community. I wanted you on the show. I wanted somebody on the show to talk about bones, but actually it's been kind of hard to even find bone health, specifically women's bone health experts. So I am, this is long overdue. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. I am so glad to be here and um, can't wait to tell everyone about bones and why it's important to women in particular. Yeah. And I'm excited that I get to do it on International Women's Day too. <laughs> I know, it's, such a, it's really quite astute. Maybe, maybe I'll just say that I was specifically waiting for today because bone health is that important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Cheryl, where are you calling in from today? I am in Redondo Beach, California. All right. Nice, nice. Well, you know, we'd love to kick all of our interviews off with learning more about our guest because this is, you know, Femtech is about humans, right? And we want to meet the humans on our show. And so please give us a little bit of your background, like where you're from. Did you go to school? What did you study? I looked at your LinkedIn. You've been pioneering women's health for a while in different aspects. So kind of bring us through your personal timeline and how did you end up at American Bone Health? Yes. Uh, so I grew up in the Midwest in Wisconsin and uh, just loved really science growing up. And my mom was a physical fitness instructor and was all about health and wellness way ahead of her time. Um, so <laughs> I got a degree in microbiology and really thought that I wanted to get into doing some sort of health research. And I ended up spending the first 30 years of my career um, working in the life sciences and biopharmaceutical industry, starting with doing actually clinical research in women's health and um, really moving through a lot of different roles into commercial leadership positions. Um, one of the things that I did that I really enjoyed was leading an organization that was all about patient engagement and helping people tell their health stories to help improve outcomes for other people and develop new solutions and really got into um, uh, helping people advocate and working on advocacy. And when it was time for me to think about what is, what is that next chapter and what's really important to me and where can I make a difference? It was um, getting into a role with a nonprofit organization where I could really take everything I had done across my career and put it towards really helping to empower people to take charge of their health. And that's how I landed at American Bone Health. I uh, took over as the executive director here a little over a year ago. Amazing. Yeah, you said that you lived had a long career in advocacy. Um, and I think that's such a critical part of women's health is advocating for yourself, advocating for other women, um, you know, I'm currently preparing a TED talk and we're, I'm going to break down bench top to bedside and every single stage of between cells to animal models, to clinical trials, everything has been based on a male model, but I get to the bedside part. And I say, even if you got all the way, your drug, your test or whatever, all the way to approve doctor's office, you still need the doctor to believe you you know, in order to even get that test done. And so that's where really where I see the solution there is, I mean, I mean, we could throw papers all day at doctors, but sometimes it's that advocacy group that you need, the human stories, as you were saying, right? Yes. Do you think bone health is a particular interesting subsection of women's health that needs more advocacy? Oh my gosh, it needs a ton of advocacy because nobody is, so nobody's, there are very few people focused on women's, or not women's health, sorry, bone health. Um, but part of the problem is because there isn't a specialty that owns it. Um, you know, our healthcare system is set up in such a way that it's very siloed. We don't look at total health. We really don't. And so it's heart health. Um, you know, certain things are covered by OBGYN and some OBGYNs might look at bone health. Um, but there's your mental health, you got your nutrition, you got right. yeah, like all these different people, yeah. all these different people. And there is no one um, 
person who's looking out after your bone health and your bone health is something you need to look at across your life cycle. Um, not just when you're older. Um, so, you know, we get a little bit of that when, when our kids are seeing the pediatrician, you know, how much calcium are they consuming and making sure they're getting physical activity, but there comes a point where there's no conversation with women about bone health, um, until after menopause and quite yeah, the only honestly, thing after menopause is too late. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I hear about in terms of bones as a 30 year old woman is, uh, if you're big boned, which I don't even know if that's a real thing or not. So let's like <laughs> demystify that if that's even a real thing, but like, that's the only conversation I'm having about bones right now. Right. Like, <laughs> I don't know anything else. Um, is an orthopedic doctor, a bone doctor though? Well, they are, but they're the doctors that are going to fix your bones when they're broken. Uh -huh. um, when we think about, or, you know, they're going to help you if you need a joint replacement. And of course, with um, some of um, bone conditions, they're going to be your primary point of contact. But when we think about um, weak bones and uh, osteoporosis, they're not going to actually manage osteoporosis. What what orthopedes do is they fix the broken bone. Yeah, that's what I have a reflection. I remember a and cast, purple cast. I was right. nine, fell off my bike, you know, like, yeah. But I didn't realize that they, that was pretty much, they were more of a bone mechanic then, I guess, yes. right? A, I think that's a good way to yeah. put it. Yes, and, and not to devalue what they do at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're very important, right? But yeah. um, it's really more of that mechanics and not, Part of that, how do you take care of your bones throughout your life? Like, can you imagine not having your bones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody thinks about that. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't we don't think about our bones until we have a broken bone. Yeah. Um, and very rarely do we think about why did that bone break if it was not from a trauma. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if if you just bump into something and break a bone or you fall from standing height and break a bone that's not normal like okay. your bones should not do that yeah and then you need to figure out why are my bones weak and and there's a lot of a lot of different reasons that that can happen so excited to dive into this with you about like what is the purpose of bones besides just being able to stand and move right like giving a platform for our muscles but before we get into the science, because I'm so excited, the nerd in me is very excited. <laughs> I want to learn a little bit more about the organization, American Bone Health. Yeah. What is what does the organization do? What is its mission? Um, what should people know about it? Yeah, thanks. So American Bone Health, we're we're a national community-based organization. We're a nonprofit organization. And our mission is to engage, educate, and empower people to build and keep strong bones for life so that they can live a long, healthy, active life without fractures, without broken bones. And so when you hear me talk about fractures and broken bones, it's the same thing. Um, but the way we, we really provide this education is through collaborating with national organizations and with community-based organizations to provide educational programming at the community level, um, we have a lot of online resources, lots of tools for how to communicate with your healthcare provider, um, as well as, so we do program, we have um, our volunteers that do deliver our programs across the country are called peer educators. We um, have people who are across the United States trying to educate people about bone health. And we have um, various what we call our signature programs or one hour long programs that are led by our peer educators um, to really um, help people understand all the different facets of what they need to do, know to build and keep strong bones. Um, and one other thing that we do that I'm really, really excited about, and we'll wanna talk about this a little bit more, but we do have a, a risk tool for people who are age 45, and above, it's a fracture risk assessment tool that's a really important um, tool that we can offer people where they can understand what their risk of breaking a bone over the next 10 years is if they're 45 and older. 
Wow. Amazing work you're doing. Very important. <laughs> I should probably, I want to attend one of those webinars. <laughs> again. I, I have some really basic questions such as this one. What are the purpose of bones? <laughs> like what do bones <laughs> think besides be a, you know, a platform for my muscles yeah. or bones? Well, they, you know, they, your bones hold you up, right? They protect your organs. They help you move. Um, but their bones are, I think a lot of people don't realize this, they're living tissue. So your bones are constantly turning over. So, um, we have, um, bones, bone. So there's two different kinds of cells and there's a process called remodeling that happens with our bones. And so, um, when we're young, we're building much more bone than we're losing. But this process of remodeling is um, really, you have these cells that are called osteoblasts, they're building new bone. And then we've got cells called osteoclasts that are removing old or damaged bones. And so with this process, um, when we're younger, we have, you know, we're building much more bone than we're losing. Um, but every seven to 10 years, you have new bones. Like well, just like the cells in your body, you know, just, yeah. 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 So, and, yeah. and they do a lot, right? So you've, you, your bones are where you you've got your blood cells coming from and they do so many things, but the, I think the thing to know is that if you're not giving your bones what they need to be healthy, then your body's going to take things from your bones. So for example, if you're not getting enough calcium, your body's going to take the calcium out of your bones. Um, it's really an important component of your bones, but your bones are going to get weak. And we'll talk more about things that, you know, will cause that to happen. But, um, with regards to basics on your bones, you know, you start building, you're building your both bone mass. You'll build more bone between the ages of nine and 14 than you'll ever lose in your life. So oh. that time frame is so critical. Um, and I get really concerned right now with what has happened with the pandemic, what we hear about nutrition levels in our country inactivity. I mean, I see it with, I've got two teenagers. I'm like working hard to make sure they're moving. And, you know, this having been, you know, basically isolated for two years and not out and moving as much. And it's, I think we're going to see an impact um, because there's, there are things that you need to do to keep your bones healthy. It's what you need to do to keep your body healthy, right? It's good nutrition, exercise, weight bearing exercise, so anyway, ages nine to 14, really important. By the time you're 30, you've hit your peak bone mass. So now, now, things, now things are going to level <laughs> off. So your bones are as strong right now as they're ever going to be. So, oh boy. so I'm, now, here for Iron Man. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so then what happens is, you know, we stay steady. You're building about as much as you're losing, building about as much as you're losing, but then it starts dropping off as we get a little bit older. So you're going to lose more than you build. And for women, estrogen is really important for your bones. So when you start losing estrogen, which is around menopause, so in the years of like perimenopause to postmenopause, you're gonna start losing a lot of bone mass because you're losing your estrogen. And this is why we see this you know, when we talk about osteoporosis, which is weakening of the bones, um, we see this impacting older people. Age is a, has a, a big effect on this because of that estrogen dropping off. And, and for men, it just happens later because they hit um, loss of testosterone or andropause later in life than, than women do. But we're, we're going to focus on women today. So <laughs> that estrogen is really important for your bones. Um, do you know why? So, do we know why estrogen? What is estrogen doing? It, for your it, it really, it, it helps. It's just part of what we need to help keep them strong. Part of that metabolic process. Got it. Got it. I have a question about milk. I grew up in the nineties where all the posters at my gym at my elementary school, my high school were athletes with a milk mustache. And it was like, yep. drink milk, have strong bones. 
is that real? Is that true? Like you, I mean, I know calcium is important, but like, is it really about milk? Like we're the only mammal that's drinking other mammals milk. So I'm, I'm, and we're not the only one with bones. So I'm kind of confused. <laughs> <laughs> so what I will say is that dairy is a great source of calcium and it's a very, you can get a lot of calcium from a small amount of dairy, right? But is it the only way that you can get calcium? No, it's not. Um, you know, dark leafy greens, um, almonds, other foods have calcium. It's about making sure that you're getting enough calcium every day. There's a lot of foods that are fortified with calcium. I'm not a milk drinker and my family would be horrified to hear this because my parents both grew up on dairy farms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there are a lot of people who are either lactose or intolerant, or there are cultures where milk is not something that they consume. And so, yes, there are lots of other ways that you can get your calcium. One thing I will say is that it's best to get your calcium from nutrition, but there are calcium supplements if you can't get everything that you need from, from your diet. So. I think the important thing is to know that there's only so much calcium your body can take in at one time. And the other thing is, it's really important to get vitamin D. Your body can't absorb the calcium without the vitamin D. And very few of us get enough vitamin D from sunlight alone. And so it's really important to talk to your healthcare provider to see what your vitamin D levels are and if you need to take a vitamin D supplement. Got it. And what did you say about move or exercise and movement having to do with your bone health? I ah. think about that being more like your muscles, you know, what, is, why do your bones benefit from movement too? Your bones need to actually get loaded. Uh, they need weight bearing load on them in order to stimulate that bone growth. Oh. So what that means is that you need to do things to kind of jar the bones. They like that. So, um, you know, like jumping that. jacks are that. great, right? Um, any kind of weight bearing exercise, walking is good, but running is better. Of course, as we age, running gets to be something that's not as easy. So there are lots of different things you can do, but there are certain activities that while they're really good for your muscles and good for your heart and, and all of that's important, they don't put load on your bones. And so cycling, swimming, really great exercise, but you still need to do something to put some load on your bones. Got it. Did the exercise regimen change after menopause? Like, should you continue to do weight bearing stuff or is that like more high risk? No, you should continue to do it. And what I would say is if, if you are diagnosed with osteoporosis, and we can talk about what that looks like, then you just want to make sure that you are following protocols that don't put you at risk of breaking a bone. Um, and there are lots of ways to get that weight bearing exercise and to work out and do that without harming your body. Uh, how do I know if my bones are healthy? <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, okay. that's, you know, that's a good question because, you know, our bones, you, you, you don't, feel, yeah, you don't like, feel anything. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the tricky thing. So, um, in order to look at our bones, we do something that's called a, a bone density test or a DEXA test or DEXA scan. And it is, um, you typically they're done where you can get your mammogram. And you basically lay on a table with your clothes on, and it uses a really low amount of radiation. They do a scan over your, um, really looking at, it's looking at your spine and your hips. So you're not enclosed in anything. It, it's a very simple test. And it, what it does is it looks at the density of your bones, which is which is one measure of something to look at as far as a risk factor for whether or not you're at high risk of fracturing your bones. Um, now, typically we don't have bone density tests done until we are around menopause age. So when you get your welcome to Medicare packet, 
you get told, hey, guess what? You are now, you now qualify to get your DEXA. Well, um, you know, there are a lot of different guidelines out there around when you should get a uh, bone density test and um, a lot of different views on this based on what your risk factors are, but it would be, it's really good for women to have a bone density test before they go through menopause so that you know what your baseline bone density is. And what um, a bone density test gives you, you get, a, um, you get a score, it's called a T-score. And basically what we're doing is measuring the bone density and comparing it against the bones of a healthy 30 year old. And that's because that's when you have your peak bone mass. And so if you have a score and it's a standard deviation, if you end up with what's called a T-score of minus one and above, then you have healthy bones. If you fall in the range of a T-score of between minus one to minus 2.5, you get a classification that's called osteopenia or low bone density. And then if you're minus below minus, if you're minus 2.5 and below, you get us, you're told that you have osteoporosis. So what it is, is it's a measure of the density. Now, is that going to tell you hundred percent the health of your bones? It's not, it's the gold standard that we have for diagnosing osteoporosis. So weakened bones, but osteo, just that alone is not enough to really go by. Um, because more people break bones every year who have a classification of osteopenia than those who have osteoporosis. What? That doesn't <laughs> sound right. Why would that be the case? It's because there are a lot of different risk factors that come into play and because density oh. is not necessarily quality. Oh, so the people where the density might be mediocre or, you know, not too bad, not amazing, but they may have something else going on with their bones that we didn't see in the density test that is thereby, you know, the catalyst to it breaking or something. So, so it's we have tests or like, is this an area <laughs> of innovation? More like diagnostic well, here? this, this is an this is an area of, of innovation, I would say. And so there is a, um, a new technology that is called TBS that, so it gives you a trabecular bone score. That's what TBS stands for. And so what it does is it's software that is a, basically put on the DEX machine that takes a look at the micro architecture of your bones. And it gives you bone quality which will help determine your risk for fracture. And there's other ways that we can get at risk for fracture as well. Um, this is not, um, I, I was actually just happy to see that they just got um, uh, Medicare reimbursement codes for this technology. It's not across the board at this point, but it's certainly something that's helping to, you know, really gonna help look at bone quality for people. Um, and then there is some AI work being done, you know, with um, looking at CT scans and picking up spine fractures that have happened and trying to identify things that way. But I think there is such a huge opportunity for so much more. Yeah. Are there a lot of research laboratories on bone health? I feel like they, they would might be leading in terms of innovation for this stuff. But is there a lot of researchers? In There's, there is some research going on, but you know, we know, <laughs> I think the thing is people feel like we know a lot about bones. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> research going on um, and, and looking at different things that are impacting bones. Um, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit about risk factors and age and gender are, are two of the main risk factors for having weakened bones. So being a woman and, and aging as we discussed, but there's a lot of other risk factors too. And it's really important for people to know about those um, because there are certain medical conditions and um, medications that people take that can really impact their bones. Oh, so can you give us some examples? If you have autoimmune disease, so rheumatoid arthritis is one oh. that's really key. 
um, diabetes, both type one and type two diabetes, puts you at increased risk of weakened bones. Um, certain cancers, breast cancer and prostate cancer, now not prostate cancer for women, um, but breast cancer. And um, then there are actually anything that is a um, malabsorption disease. So where your body is not able to absorb all the nutrients. So things like celiac disease, Crohn's disease, um, disordered eating is one that comes yeah, let's into talk play. about that because disordered eating, you know, eating disorders disproportionately affect females. So how does, you know, anorexia and bulimia affect your bone health? If you are not getting enough of those nutrients that your bones need, your body takes them out of your bones. So they will, your body will take the calcium from your bones to do the other things in your body that your body needs calcium for. Think about how important it is for your heart. Um, and so the bones get depleted. Uh, we actually have talked to people. There's, in fact, there's somebody on our board of directors who um, found out um, that she had the bones of a 70 year old when she was in her, I want to say when she was in her thirties, um, through participating in just, a, a quick clinical research study doing a, a DEXA test, but she had an eating disorder when she was younger and she has been able to completely turn her bones around. Um, but disordered eating is a huge thing that can really mess up your bones. Um, and I think, you know, talking about things that affect women also, when we look at, you know, teenagers to young adults who really exercise a lot and don't get enough nutrition in their bodies, um, there's something that is called red S or reduced energy deficiency in sports. Um, if young women are losing their menstrual cycle, um, there's a good chance that they're hurting their bones. And with regards to this, it's because they're exercising so much, but they're not getting enough energy in, um, and they start seeing stress fractures. Um, we actually have someone who, um, works with us who she was a, you know, a world-class runner and, she had this happen and she was able to completely turn things around. And she's a really strong advocate for educating teenagers and young women about the importance of getting that nutrition. Because it's something that, you know, it sounds like a lot of eating disorders happen, you know, for women earlier in life. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like two, three decades later, they're getting you know, an analysis saying your bones are unhealthy. And so it's like this really long-term consequence. Is this why gymnasts in the Olympics are so short because their bones don't grow? <laughs> I, I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here to ask questions. <laughs> Maybe that's probably just because they're <laughs> that's their stature. <laughs> Simone Biles, if you're listening, please call in, tell us. <laughs> about your we, we do know that for gymnasts, this can be an issue. Now they're getting all of that great weight bearing exercise, but there is yeah. this push for female athletes to be thin and to not, mm -hmm. and in particular, you know, this is a big issue or has been a big issue for runners because there's this push to be thin, 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 and you'll go faster. But actually the truth, truth is if you're fueling your body better, um, you're going to perform better and then not have those, those injuries, those stress fractures. But, um, it is something that, you know, we see this with gymnasts as well, the reduced energy deficiency in sports. Well, you were mentioning some women th that, you know, found out that their bones were not as healthy as they thought. Um, what are the solutions to make your bones healthier? So we were talking about, you know, calcium, the vitamin D, nutrition, weight bearing activity. Is there medication? Is there therapy? Is that an area that needs more innovating? So there are medications for people who have been diagnosed with osteoporosis um, and they are typically for people who are diagnosed, I'll say postmenopausal, right? So, um, and people do get diagnosed with osteoporosis before they're postmenopausal, uh, but there is a desire to not have to put somebody on something 
earlier unless there's really a need, right? Because what these medications are great. They reduce the risk of fractures by 50%, um, which is critical because the, the problem with having osteoporosis is that you could break a bone. And while breaking a bone doesn't, sometimes it doesn't sound like much, um, but when you have osteoporosis and you break a bone, you're much more likely to break another bone. It impacts your quality of life. You can't take care of yourself. Sometimes you, you can't do your job. You like, you can't do the things that you want to do and you may never fully recover. Um, he had so nine with a purple cast. I was more concerned about people <laughs> signing it, right? Like then, uh, and then you, and using a pencil to itch Right, myself. right. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I, I loved my cast when I had <laughs> yeah. broke my wrist and I was in, you know, elementary school. Yeah. Um, but there are things you can do. So proper nutrition, uh, make sure you get enough calcium, vitamin D, protein, and magnesium. So that's just part of a, a healthy lifestyle, right? Be active. You need to get that weight bearing exercise, but you need to move. Um, and that kind of goes along with whole body health, right? Um, smoking really bad for your bones. Don't smoke, mm. don't vape. Um, alcohol also bad for your bones. So consume in moderation, excess alcohol consumption is bad for your bones. Um, and understand the things that you need to do and understand your risk factors. So if you, you know, you have a history of in the, you know, disordered eating, or you have, um, different medical conditions that can affect, um, consumption of nutrients, or if you have taken high doses of steroids for extended periods of time, that's something that's really bad for our bones. Um, cancer, certain cancers. So breast cancer is one of those I've mentioned, um, and other cancers and some of their treatments, diabetes, HIV, this is a growing concern. Um, and it, it's, it's not that the HIV itself is growing. A wonderful thing is that HIV has become a chronic condition with the wonderful treatments that we have. And so people are living longer, but HIV and some of the treatments for HIV weaken the bones. And we're actually seeing that um, HIV because it advances aging in people um, just due to the disease itself, um, it causes a lot of problems for the bones. Um, so who knew? who knew our bones in the back end, taking the brunt of all <laughs> these things that I did. Yeah. I thought we only were worried and, if we were broken or not, you know, I didn't and know the other, and another thing that affects a lot of women is thyroid disease. So uh -huh. definitely How does thyroid disease have to do with your bones. Well, if you have hyperthyroidism and if you take, um, um, X, it, it's all tied together because it's all part of your endocrine system. Yeah, um, all about the hormones. Yeah, it is. So mm -hmm. if you, if you have some of these conditions then you need to, um, talk to your doctor and say, Hey, you know, I have this and I, I want to talk about my bone health. I want to have a plan for how I'm going to look at things. Um, and plus there's a lot of medications that can weaken your bones. And obviously we need to take medications that we need for other conditions, but it's, it's where you just need to know because your bones aren't going to tell you, Hey, <laughs> I'm weak. Yeah. So you yeah. need to know the things that put you at risk. And if you are over, um, if you're 45 or older, we have a simple risk tool that you complete can take online. It's 17 questions. It takes about a minute and a half to complete. And it asks about your personal risk factors. And then it gives you your risk of breaking a bone in the next 10 years due to weakened bones because of the risk factors. It's a validated tool. Um, and it's, it's something that then you get a risk level of low, moderate, or high. And we help you with tools and resources to understand what you should do. And if you're moderate or high risk, you should definitely have a DEXA scan, which you can only get from seeing a doctor. You have to get a prescription. So you can't just go somewhere and say, Hey, can I get a DEXA? Uh -huh. um, but then make sure that you're doing those things that you need to do to keep your bones as strong as possible. It's never too late to do something for your bones. That's the good news. Yeah. Like 
there are things we can do. Well, you know, one of the main issues in women's health is having our physicians believe us, right? And I mean, we can go to physicians with, hey, I, I felt a lump yesterday in my breast. I can't find it today, but I know I felt it. And if the doctor can't find it, a lot of times they don't move forward. Or a woman complains about pain and pain isn't visual, but you can, she knows that she can feel it. How can a woman advocate for herself when she's like, my bones feel fine, but I can't really feel them. But I took this online quiz uh, and it says I'm at high risk. Um, what other advice do you have for women going and what doctor do they see? Is it their primary care? Who do they see? And like, what are some tools they could use to like get the physician on board with getting them that scan? Yeah. So um, most people will start with their primary care physician. Um, I wish there was a like bone doctor, right? I said bone doctor. There are a couple specialties that where there are people who specialize in bones um, and so rheumatologists, endocrinologists, um, and some OBGYNs, um, I would like to say, I, you know, I feel bad for primary care physicians. They have to know so much and they get oh, yeah. so, and they get so little time with people. Right. Yeah. And I will tell you that bone health falls to the bottom of the pile for almost everyone because there's, because you can't feel anything. Right. And, um, so what I would say to people is you have to go in and you have to say, look, I have these risk factors. So by taking our fracture risk assessment, you know what your risk factors are. We have tools for people to actually help them have the conversation with their doctor to guide them. And if your doctor, you know, your primary care doctor, um, it's just not their thing, then ask them to refer you to a specialist. So look for an endocrinologist, um, look for a bone um, clinic. So a lot of um, hospitals and or academic institutions will have a bone clinic. And so you wanna look for places that specialize in bones. Awesome advice, awesome. One, another thing we would think about a lot in women's health is that um, based on your race and your culture, you're going to get either you have more likely risks or you're going to be treated differently. Do we yeah. know of any um, like race dependent risk factors for bone health? We, we do. And it's really around some of these medical conditions that mm -hmm. are um, more likely to be seen in certain populations than others. So um, actually being white is a huge risk factor for weak bones, but I think we need a lot more work done in other populations. And one thing I will tell you is that the black community is often told, no, you don't need to worry about your bones because typically, um, black people have thicker bones, um, a higher bone density, but if they have diabetes or some of these other conditions, it weakens their bones. And we do know from looking at Medicare data that when black people have osteoporosis and broken bones, they have worse outcomes than other populations. And so there are, we, we need much more work to be done yeah. to address the differences um, across the different races. And that's something that we're working with people on and really developing information that's targeted to different populations. Even just differences in um, diet can impact what happens with your bones. So if culturally you don't typically consume foods that are high in calcium, well, that's going to be bad for your bones. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So interesting. It sounds to me like we are still at the very beginning of bone research and like <laughs> bone knowledge. So like we, we can't even dive into like racial discrepancies because it's like we have barely just started to like ask that question. It sounds like in terms of bone health data. Well, we do, you know, we know that, um, Asians, um, Asians are at higher risk for, fractures. And um, we're seeing now that the Hispanic population 
is as well, but it's often tied to some of these other comorbidities. Um, so yeah. when you look at the risk factors and the medical conditions that people have that put them at increased risk, um, it's, it's tied a lot to that. I have one more question about bones um, before we go to our last two questions that our listeners love. But I heard that your bones uh, are flexible during pregnancy because your hip bones like spread when you're giving birth. Can you tell me more about that? Is that true? <laughs> I don't think that it's really your bones that spread. I think it's the connective tissue that loosens oh. up. Um, yeah, so, that makes a lot more sense because I was like, whoa, like your bone, your hips like but, expand, but maybe, yeah, maybe it's more the connective tissue that's expanding rather than bones because bones yeah. are solid. They can't bones, really bones are solid. When now when you're an infant, when you're born, um, you know, your bones are forming and you actually have more bones when you're born and then they start fusing and um, developing. So, you know, at that point in life. Yes, but no, your bones when you're older should not, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so funny. I, uh, in college, I remember asking a, our neuroscience professor, like, how much smarter we'd be if we use our whole brain because we only use 10% because I had heard that. And he was like, so non- it's not nice about it. He was like, that's not true. You should know that we use our whole brain. And I was like, oh God, I felt like dying. I felt like going under a table and dying. Cause I guess I had just never questioned it. Uh, and now I live a unapologetic life of questions where I'm like, Hey, if I have this question, you know, the other Absolutely. people that too. I was just yeah. the one who got thrown under the bus. So listeners more than happy to be your under the bus thrower. So bone stretching during pregnancy, not likely, probably connective tissue. We should look into that. Uh, the two last questions that we love are, uh, if someone wanted to start a femtech company, we have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs that listen. What's an area in women's health and wellness that you think still needs innovating? I think looking at, at women's health across the lifespan, um, uh, this is like something I... <laughs> I, it just drives me crazy because nobody is doing this. And how can we bring all the pieces together and, and have some sort of even like AI think about this with bone health, right? Because I don't, nobody thinks about things in isolation and there are all these risk factors I've been talking about and things that should be red flags for healthcare providers to say, oh, I should do a bone density test because wow. of X, Y, and Z. There's no way they could ever keep all of that in their heads. So we need to have some way to look at women's health from cradle to grave across the board and whole health and everything that, you know, along the way that goes in together. And, and even if there were a way that, you know, I, my dream is like, I, I hate to say electronic medical record, but everything together. And then based on things that, you know, and, and as we improve what we learn about the role of different um, hormones and, or, you know, things that we can test in the blood or anything that would show up in your lab tests and just everything, then triggers that could come up that flag you, oh, hey, you're at risk for this, or you should be paying attention to this. Um, just so that we could be ahead of things. I, I think I would love to see us in a world where we are preventing things. And that's our whole focus at American Bone Health is let's prevent the fractures, let's prevent the weak bones, and let's not wait until something breaks and fixes it. Let's get ahead of it and let's be all about preventive health. And um, that would, I think, improve a lot of things. Love that holistic preventative health and with a, like a big medical brain that like has all the data and yes. says, hello, I'm connecting <laughs> dots that you don't know about. Like here you, you need to look at. Uh, and our last question is, what do you think the fintech industry as a whole needs the most right now in order to be successful? Oh, the most money, more money, more money put in towards it. I mean, I think it's so exciting to see so many people 
um, interested in getting into it. I mean, I think we need people to continue to be curious and push, but we also need the funding to be able to deliver deliver the tools and innovations and resources. That's right. And in money in this context, only because we have had a lot of people say money. And at the end of the day, they actually, they meant like investing in startups or they meant government grants. And so for you, when you say money, well, how does that manifest for you? I, I think um, for, for us, it's, it's funding to continue to expand on the tools and resources to do more with um, our fracture risk calculator, which we've done a lot with recently. We have a ton of data that I think is going to show some really good stuff. We've been able to wow. move people along the care spectrum, but money going into startups, um, money going into areas that it hasn't before, whether it's federal or it's private sector, um, mm -hmm. someone's, someone's got to take a, a look. And, and I know we're getting more going on in this area. But um, there's a lot, long ways to go before we have that big brain and computer, as you said, uh, yes. <laughs> it's yes. going to help us all figure it out. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Cheryl, this has been so informative. I'm so glad we finally have a good bone health episode. This was a really solid one. I will be referring to for a while, for, you know, for a long time coming, I'll be referring to this episode because I learned a lot today. Thank you so much for your time. Oh my gosh, Brittany, thank you so much. Really appreciate you having me on.